At this point, although Alexandra insisted that the Russian people were devoted to their sovereign, there was a great separation between the emperor and the people. For the upcoming several months, Nicholas refused to cave in. Meanwhile, the revolt in St. Petersburg was spreading all over Russia, consisting of riots, strikes, murders, mutinies, and a rebellion among the peasants. Thousands of people were killed, but even so, the strikes continued. Russia's crisis worsened a few months later, in May of 1905. During the Battle of Tsushima, the Russian Baltic Fleet, a ship which was trying to replace losses acquired at the beginning of the Russian-Japanese War, was destroyed by the Japanese. This caused the revolution to spread even further. By September, the government was dysfunctional. In October of 1905, fueled by the railway strike all throughout Russia, Tsar Nicholas II had to make a decision. He could either give up his power to a military dictatorship or grant Russia a constitution. He finally granted the constitution on October 17th after writing, There was no other way out but to cross oneself and give what everyone was asking for. The October Manifesto was issued on October 17, 1905, as a response to the unsuccessful Russian Revolution of 1905. The Manifesto pledged to grant freedom of conscience, speech, meeting, and association. It also promised that from then on, people wouldn't be sent to jail without a fair trial. Finally, it guaranteed that no law would be made legal without confirmation by the State Duma, the newly constituted parliament. But since Nicholas had full control over almost everything, including the Duma, army, and Russia's money, it was bound to fail. The opening of the first Duma was an emotional event for the Romanovs. Nicholas used his power to overrule the Duma. First Duma of 1906. Rejected. Second Duma of 1907. Shut down. Third Duma of 1907. Ran its full term. Fourth Duma of 1912. Voted to support Nicholas II and his government. With the constitution in the past, the health of Nicholas's son was the first thing on his mind. Grigory Rasputin, a Siberian peasant, was introduced to the Romanovs in 1905. While plowing one day, he was suddenly dazzled by a vision. He was touched by the Heavenly Mother. She told him of the young Alexei, the Tsarevich, and instructed him to appear at the boy's side to stop his bleeding, which was a result of hemophilia. When he met the Imperial family, he laid his hand on the boy's leg, and the bleeding immediately stopped. You'll be all right. But only God can tell you what will happen tomorrow. Soon, Alexandra believed Rasputin was a man of God, and her son's only hope, since the doctors could not help him. However, people grew suspicious as the two kept meeting in secrecy, and rumors were circulating amongst the Russians. But Alexandra and Nicholas refused to let the real reason be known to the public, since they didn't want sympathy or for Alexei's disease to be known. They decided to keep the reality hidden, so that their fantasy could be maintained and the autocracy preserved. Stolypin became Prime Minister in 1906, following the October Manifesto. He was seen as the last hope for intelligent government in Russia, and people hoped he would take Russia from an ancient autocracy into a modern democratic state. Russia prospered under his rule. Much happened during the four years of Stolypin's reign. The Romanovs went on with their lives, which were focused on helping the heir, Alexei. At first, Nicholas thought Rasputin was a simple and religious Russian man. Rasputin helped hundreds of people and was very generous. He went from rags to riches and insisted that Nicholas regarded him as Christ and that he could do anything he wanted with Alexandra. In 1908, Rasputin found himself in a serious conflict with the Romanovs. Nicholas agreed that he and Alexandra would no longer see him. There were complaints about his immoral lifestyle. In the beginning of 1911, copies of letters Rasputin had received from the Empress and her daughters were released to all of Russia. This was done by Rasputin himself. I only wish one thing, to fall asleep forever on your shoulders and in your arms. Where are you? Where have you gone? Oh, I am so sad and my heart is longing. Will you soon be again close to me? Come quickly. I love you forever. This developed into a huge scandal involving pornographic pictures, but there was absolutely no evidence that the Empress was ever Rasputin's mistress. However, Prime Minister Stolypin was not convinced. He ordered for another police investigation and demanded that Rasputin evacuate St. Petersburg immediately. This caused tension between Alexandra and the Prime Minister. Same year of 1911, Stolypin was assassinated, allowing for Rasputin to make a comeback in 1912. Once he returned, he picked up where he left off, continuing to see the imperial family. 
The day after the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand in the summer of 1914, the Romanov family was informed of the attempted assassination of Rasputin, finding this event more alarming. On July 28, 1914, Russia officially became part of World War I. This war brought about both the best and worst of Nicholas and Alexandra. It showed their dedication to Russia's victory. However, the war was no answer to the country's problems. In December of 1916, Rasputin was murdered by Prince Yusupov and Grand Duke Dmitri as a so-called political act to save Russia. They were later exiled from St. Petersburg under the command of Nicholas. The Russian Revolution of 1917 was neither avoidable nor unexpected, yet for some reason everyone was still taken by surprise. At the beginning of 1917, Alexandra had the right to fear for her own and her children's safety. The effects of the war left Russia's economy in a state of inflation, which was the last straw leading to the breakout of the revolution. The first stage of the revolution began on March 8th of 1917. There were waves of strikes as hungry people crowded the streets in Petrograd, demanding bread. The Tsar commanded his troops to restrain the strikers, but they didn't listen and instead sided with the hungry strikers, meaning Nicholas no longer had the army to protect him. Nicholas was losing power. A few days later, he ordered the Fourth Duma to suspend its sessions, but it refused. Neither the upper nor the lower classes accepted the authority of the Tsar, and the rule of Nicholas II was over. The Romanov dynasty came to an end when Nicholas's brother refused the throne. In the second phase of the revolution, the Bolsheviks seized power in Russia and founded the Soviet Union. Unfortunately, this story does not have a happy ending. After Nicholas gave up the throne, his family was put under house arrest. On the night of July 17, 1918, the family was awoken and told that there was trouble in Ekaterinburg. They were told it would be safer for them to go to the basement. They all retreated downstairs and waited for safety. Then, a group of twelve soldiers appeared. Nikolai Alexandrovich, your relatives abroad wanted to save you, but they did not succeed. And so now, we ourselves are now forced to shoot you. Nicholas. <laughs> Alexandra. <laughs> Olga. <laughs> Marie. Tatiana Anastasia Alexei And that's the end of our story. I hope you enjoyed it.